You know, the funny thing about uh, talking about your past, it feels like you always had the answers, right? And it's easy to say that, oh, I knew, I knew, I knew, I knew. In most things, I won't be able to say that I knew I was on the right course. But for the Wu-Tang Clan, I knew. Peace, what up, yo, it's the RZA, right here from the Wu-Tang Clan. And this is the timeline of my career. When I first started making music, I was part of a crew, me, Old Dirty Bastard, and the Jizzle called All In Together Now. And we had joined a manager named Mel Kwan. And Mel Kwan thought that I had the lyrical talent to be a solo artist. And uh, so he put me in the studio to record songs on my own. But none were as catchy or as poppy as the hip hop movement was at that time. And so Tommy Boy, uh, suggested that I recorded a song that had more of a pop a pop appeal and uh, kind of fun female oriented oriented song and uh, Oh We Love You Our King became that song. It became my first single as a recording artist, uh, my first release, my first video. When you try to go and become an artist and you record a song and you get a video, you feel that life is going to be all uphill. But the song didn't work. And so eventually Tommy Boy pulled the plug on my album project. It was a defeat in all reality. But I think my determination and my personality of like not accepting defeat, I didn't blame myself. I didn't blame nobody. I just felt like it was a bad move and I got to make a better move. And so even though I felt uh, the defeat of it, that defeat actually fueled me to make sure that my next attempt became successful. Style the rockets, ten times ten men committing mass and turn the other chicken, I'll break the chin. Slain boom bangs like African drugs. Coming around a mountain when I come. For me creatively, I realized that the best thing I could do was express myself unfiltered, uninfluenced by outside opinions. If I'm feeling good about it, and if my immediate crew around me is feeling good about it, something has to be good about it. And so I returned back to my to my hip hop roots, which is just making beats in my basement, making songs spontaneous based on the vibe that I was feeling. It was all about just coming with the natural, unpredictable talent that I felt that I had inside me. And that led me to start making beats that was probably obscure, or very different from a lot of producers at the time. And it also led me to connect with my Wu-Tang brothers, other MCs who also was hungry for the raw style of hip hop, uh, the style of hip hop that was really based in lyricism and MC battles and challenges. And you take that energy along with, I think some of the mythology that, that we acquired through watching Kung Fu movies and reading comic books. And when we fused our natural lives together, it definitely affected and created a product that stand the test of time. And for me to go back and reflect on the first sessions that Wu-Tang had, I mean, it had to be something like Columbus, you know, discovering America, like a new frontier. But to get all nine members and all this energy bundled together in a studio session was unknown of, unheard of. And, and for me, it was just total excitement. And as the producer, I never left the studio. You know, when you look back and see me in old documentaries, you'll see me just, you could tell that my underarms were smelling bad, yo. Because you could tell that I slept there, I got up the next day, I kept going, I kept going. It felt kind of almost like a mad scientist trying to create something. Exuberating, exhilarating, every, I mean, all the energies that, have, that I felt recording that album uh, has never been captured again in all reality. It was experimenting and going into what was unknown, you know, but bravely going into it, you know, creatively. As that style of uh, bringing sound and energy together was, was definitely new. And as that mad scientist producer, it was like the trip of a lifetime. Escape from your dragon's lair 
In particular, my beats travel like a vortex through your spine to the top of your cerebral cortex. Make you feel like you bust for raw sex. After going through the uh, first five albums, Enter the 36 Chambers, Return to the 36 Chambers, ODB, Takao by Method Man, Only Built for Cuban Links by Raekwon, Liquid Sports by The Jizzer, even Iron Man by Ghostface Killer and maybe The Grave Diggers. So all these records that came out uh, all was platinum or gold and critically acclaimed and it was like the Wu movement felt like it was really firmly established in hip hop. So after all these solo albums, it's now time to regroup and go back in the studio and try to recapture that team of energy that we did on 36 Chambers. I was probably at my, my best creative self. I have gained some knowledge on music theory. My music equipment was advanced at that stage as well. It wasn't the same as when we was doing the first album where we all was in the studio, you know, sharing a beer or sharing a sandwich. It was like now uh, success was tasted by everyone. It wasn't egos, it was more like everyone now wanted to come back together and prove that Wu-Tang could be number one. I asked these guys to give me five years and I promised we would be number one. So now it was time to live up to that promise. We actually all headed to California and uh, we had what they call the Oakwood Apartments and we rented out 15 apartments. Uh, we rented out two studios and these studios was going 24 hours a day. It was really like the studio was kind of like a barbecue, you know what I mean? Because there was just so many of us there and so much talent uh, being recorded. We rocked that place. It came out and it was number one on the billboards. We shipped two million records in the first couple of weeks. And it was a double album. And so that means it ended up grossing the industry about $40 million. You know? And that's like Hollywood numbers, you know what I mean? We felt like Hollywood stars. We definitely felt like we were sitting on top of the world. I felt it as a producer, as an MC. But more importantly for me, I think I felt that what I considered the nine greatest MCs in the world had arrived to their destiny to show the world that it was number one. It was our triumph. Quality. I always see everything, brother. So after Wu Tang Forever, if any fans of Wu Tang will you know listen to the album, you'll notice songs like Reunited, and you'll hear uh, live violins being played, and you'll hear that certain melodies and certain chord progressions are starting to grow. It's starting to become more classical and production style. So music theory is evolving more and more inside of me. And then having the chance to befriend Quincy Jones and have a lot of conversations with him about jazz theory and what music should be. And then one day in my office, uh, a guy named Dreddy Kruger shows up at my office with Jim Jarmusch. And Jim Jarmusch, I think they met each other. Uh, they have the same uh, weed dealer. <laughs> he shows up and he says that he has a film he's working on called Ghost Dog and he want me to be the composer. And it clicked for me. It's like, wow, I was headed to be a composer. And it all just fell in place. I had a conversation with Quincy Jones. He composed his first movie at the age of 30. And I think I had just turned 28. And I was like, well, if I start now, maybe I could catch up and be, you know, as great as you one day. When you want to go from hip hop music to scoring, it's not an easy transition, all right? It's a, in fact, if you hear Jim tell you the story, I could have been, up to that date, the toughest composer he, he worked with because I didn't understand the technical, uh, logistical side of what composing was. Jim, you know, he tells the story and we laugh about it, that, you know, I would show up to the scoring session with a DAC full of music, but not placed properly in the, in the movie. And I'll show up like at 11 p.m. at night, me and ODB with a couple of 40s. And he's like, here's, 
here's the next few pieces of music that I wrote for the movie. And he has to go and figure out, like, wait, what do I do? I said, well, that's for that scene. But but you can't do like that's for that scene. It has to be like, there's an in, there's an out. There's a cue sheet. There was no cue sheet for Ghost Dog. Kill Bill, I think, was like one of the coolest things that uh, had happened in my career to that date. I mean, having number one albums and gold and platinum records, of course, is, is great. But a movie score on such a big film, and I think we got nominated for BAFTAs and Oscars. It was just a different, uh, a different experience for me. And working with a great mind like Quentin Tarantino, a great creative mind, a, a music lover, and eventually a mentor of mine. And when he had this script for Kill Bill, he uh, put it in my hands, said, well, I want you to read this. And I read it and I was just amazed by it. I think it was like 200 pages, but in the original draft of the script, he had like the sound effects written in it. Cause you know, I make my music like that. So I'm like, this guy's in the same mind frame. I actually realized that I wanted to learn about film directing and uh and he was interested in learning about music production and we said we would exchange ideas and that led to me uh going to china on set with my composition notebook and writing and taking lessons about film directing from angles to what a DP does, what the production designer does. I just spent time studying and, and Quentin was a, a gracious teacher. And maybe around uh, the final week of shooting in Mexico, a few other producers were saying, you know, Riz has been here for a while. What is he doing? Like, what, what part of the movie is he, you know, what is he doing? Like, you know, because mostly everybody on the movie set is part of a movie set, you know what I mean? And Quinn is like, well, I haven't decided what Bobby's gonna do for the film right now. He's just, you know, he's just shadowing me, basically, you know, doing the knowledge. But I remember maybe four nights later, at the same, you know, dinner moment, he makes an announcement. I've decided what I want Bobby to do for my film. He's gonna be my composer. And up to that day, Quinn Tarantino never used a composer for any of his films. And he said, I want you to do for my film the same way you produce your music. I want that same type of energy. The same way, you know, the sound effects, the vibes, the different, the stings, the, a lot of different things, I think, that he found in Wu-Tang Music, he wanted Kill Bill to encompass into his soundscape as well. It not only enhanced me in the sense of in my musicality and composing and in the process of doing something, it also led on to a six-year mentorship, led me to become a movie director. So uh, Kill Bill is uh, always going to be one of those great markers in my career line. They made me a cripple. But if you help me, I'll forge my greatest weapon ever. I met Russell Crowe, an American gangster. We kicked it off, you know. Became friends and um, just had this broham energy about us. He was doing another film called The Next Three Days and Paul Haggis thought it'd be funny if I came in, uh, played a character that beats him up with a stick because he, he knew our relationship, he thought that'd be funny. I thought it'd be funny. I don't know, maybe it was a three week, four week shoot, but my schedule of working was, you know, a day here, a day there. So I had a lot of time and walking through all the steel mills. And I just kind of really went back to Pittsburgh is a, a town that I spent some time in in my youth. So now I really had a chance to go back through it and study it more. And I was studying really the foundation of steel and, and you know, all the things about it. After studying with Quentin for six years, he explained to me that the best thing I can do now is write. You know, I could go out and look for a job as a director and maybe, do, you know, do this or do that. But he, he told me that, you know, he writes his own material and he thought that that would be the best direction for me. And it sunk into me and I started writing Mail the Iron Fist and I didn't finish it really until I was in Pittsburgh with, uh, with Russell. I was in this whole still valley mode and the blacksmith being that character, I fully developed it. And then uh, around the time when we almost finished the film, I had a draft of the script ready and I gave it to Russell just, just to read. 
a few months later, he, um, you know, he, he enjoyed it and said he's interested in, in helping me get it, get it made. The cool thing about that film, first of all, it had a lot of good buddies help me out. You know, Eli Roth co-writing it with me. I consider Eli Roth my classmate because when I was doing my mentorship with Quentin, Eli was uh, always around, always there, watching movies with Quentin and taking knowledge. And Eli was already up to bat with Hostel and a few other things. And now it was my time up to bat. And uh, Man with the Iron Fist was uh, my debut. Taking on directing, writing, and acting, I think I was too much Clint Eastwood on that, y'all. <laughs> I think um, it was like a brain surgeon course <laughs> in creativity. Because you're talking about 18 hour days easy. You know what I mean? And you're talking about every piston of my brain had to be spark because at the end of the day, I gotta worry about what is in front of the camera, what's behind the camera, what's the colors on the on the clothing, so many things. Uh, I would think it was the final molding of me as an artist. And I would also say it was potentially the forging of RZA as a man. You know, we spent nine months in China away from my family. You know, the only time I had joy was when the other actors were coming to town, come to town, you know. Other than the talent, you know, I was just there, like I said, for nine months. And, uh, but it really forged me. Then they pushing us out. This happened just how they wanted. Why don't we talk to your cousin? That dude a gangster and he made me nervous. And what the hell are we? We ain't no gangsters. After being a director for Man with the Iron Fist and getting my PhD in artist, artistic expression, I fell in love with the whole process. You know, I moved to Hollywood and had a new son named Rakim and, you know, bought a nice home and I decided this would be you know, where I spend most of my time. I spend 70% of my time right in uh, Hollywood, California. I started pursuing more expressions in the field of film, getting a chance to get um, a script called Cutthroat City. When I read it, I felt like it was meant for me to tell the story. Even though I didn't grow up in New Orleans and Hurricane Katrina, the story of four men who have a lot of aspirations and those aspirations turn into desperation. I was like, that sounds like Wu-Tang to me. You know what I mean? That sounds like my life. And we go out to New Orleans and we get a great cast, you know, from Shamik Moore to uh, Demetrius Ship Jr., Wesley Snipes, Terrence Howard, Ethan Hawke, Aza Gonzalez, you know, the name of few T.I. That energy of bringing people together, I realized is my natural ability. One thing about creativity and me as an architect, they say, of the Wu-Tang, I look to find the proper elements and ingredients to make my painting. And Cutthroat City is my latest painting. I always say that uh, even a, the greatest master always remains a student. Life teaches us every day. And for me, as an artist, I'm always striving to gain more knowledge because the more knowledge that I have, the more ways I can express myself.